All right, so we're in the second week of our mid-year missions emphasis, and we're going to connect that with the series we're doing in the book of Acts, Redefined. And you're going to see today how this connects specifically through this idea of calling and sending. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, open them there to Acts 13 or click over to Acts 13 or or swipe over uh, until you get to Acts 13. All right. And when we get to Acts 13, what we're going to see is something very pivotal occurs. This is a significant change of scenery and direction in the book of Acts. Up to this point in the book of Acts, uh, the predominant church has been the church in Jerusalem, which is what you would expect, because that was where the church began. And that was the church where Jesus' 11 disciples were after He rose from the dead. And that's where uh, all of the things that we've seen in the book of Acts, Jesus calling them together, telling them they'll be His witnesses in Jerusalem, that's where it happened. Uh, When the Spirit falls upon them and this miraculous speaking in other languages occurs, it's in Jerusalem. And this is the church that's led by people like Peter. And so we expect this to be the predominant church. By the time we get to Acts chapter 13, a shift is occurring. And the church in Jerusalem is fading from view. And the church in Antioch becomes predominant. A new church rises as the primary, the the huge instrument of God in this early work. So it's sort of like Jerusalem has been ranked number one in the polls for all of this time, but now they're slipping, and the church in Antioch has risen to, uh, to claim the number one spot. That's kind of what's happening, all right? And so when we get to Acts chapter 13, one of the things that we're going to see as this uh, first verse unfolds is a description Uh, about this church. And I want you to see this, some inside access to this church in Antioch and how they work. So, uh, this is how it reads. This is verse 1. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So, this is an introduction to the prophets and teachers. This group that was leading this church in Antioch, where great things were happening. And Luke, who who is the author of these words, has ordered this list in the way that he has for a reason. He wants you to notice the name at the beginning and the name at the end. That's why he's put them in this order. He wants you to notice Barnabas, the first name, and Saul, the second name. And we'll know Saul mostly by his new name, which is Paul, the name he'll be called. We'll see him referred to that even just later in this chapter. So Luke is setting us up for something by telling us about this church, how it's led by these prophets and teachers, two of whom are Barnabas and Saul. And that's really what the story is going to be about going forward. So look now in verse 2. Let's just begin reading the first part of verse 2 because this is where Luke is pointing us. He says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and we'll stop right there, While they, meaning these prophets and teachers, but also the entire church at Antioch, while they were gathered in this time of worship, that's what he's concerned with. So it's a time of spiritual emphasis. They're fasting, fasting almost always connected with praying. In fact, uh, in the next verse, we'll see them put the idea of fasting and praying together. So the church is gathered. It's led by these prophets and teachers. And as that is happening, notice the next phrase. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said. Did you notice that? Okay, let's stop right there. While they're worshiping, the Spirit of God speaks to them. Did you notice that? Now, it doesn't tell us how or what that looked like. Maybe it was through one of the prophets who was one of the leaders in this church. Uh, But however it happened, don't worry, I am sure that the Holy Spirit had attended the worship planning meeting this week and spoke at exactly the point in the service he was supposed to and did not go over his allotted time. Okay, so don't worry. All right, there's a bit of a rabbit trail, but it has to be said that room for the Holy Spirit to speak when we worship is extremely important. In fact, it's essential. And a lot of times as leaders, we get preoccupied with starting the service on time and ending the service on time. 
with the flow of the service and fitting in all the elements, that it's easy for us to lose sight of the importance of room for the Holy Spirit to speak. And when we're not leading worship, it's easy for us to become so concerned with whether we like what's happening or whether we don't like what's happening, right, or whether we turned in our fantasy football roster on time or whether we have lunch plans, we can miss out on the voice of the Spirit when we worship. But make no mistake, the Holy Spirit can and will speak when we worship. Last week in our service, when Greg Prickett was leading, he got up and he said, the Holy Spirit has prompted me to say something, and then he said it. If you were here, you'll remember that. And that was awesome and a really good example. But what he also shared with me later in the week was that somebody emailed him and said, The Spirit had been speaking to them, and when Greg in the service said what the Spirit had said to him, those two things connected in this person's life, and it gave them significant direction on something they were to do. That is a beautiful thing, and that's what the Spirit of God can and will do when we worship. All right, back to Acts chapter 13. This is not just a random interruption of the Spirit uh, in their service. The picture here, I think, is of the Spirit of God really guiding, really directing them as they worship. And so this church at Antioch is engaged in worship, but the Holy Spirit speaks and has something specific to say, and that's how the verse ends. Here's what the Holy Spirit said. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And the work that we will see is to be messengers, witnesses of the risen Christ in places far beyond the walls of their church and the borders of their city, to far-flung places that these guys probably couldn't even really imagine at the moment. So the Spirit says, set them apart. Pull them out of what they're currently doing. And set them over here for something new that I want to do with them and through them. That's what the Holy Spirit says. And verse 3 then shows the response of this church and of these leaders to this word from the Holy Spirit. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now that sounds pretty simple, and it's the kind of thing we expect to happen in the Bible, right? The Holy Spirit says to do something, and the people do it, right? Just like us, right? Okay. But I want you to think a little bit about what was happening here. This is the church at Antioch. Remember I told you they've risen in the polls. They're number one. Great things are happening. And they are led by this amazing leadership team. Two of the people are Barnabas and Saul. Now Barnabas and Saul are probably, at this point in the story, they are probably the most prominent guys in the work of God in this early church. These are significant leaders. And in a moment, in an instant, when the Spirit says set them aside, these people are willing to do it. Clearly, Barnabas and Saul were a big part of what was happening in in Antioch, but when the Spirit said let them go, release them, they did. I mean, that's big stuff. These are big time guys. I mean, this is Jason Moronis and Chris Conway, and let's set them aside and send them off. And they did it. They released them from their roles and their responsibilities and sent them off to something new. And this changes everything. This is the beginning of a significant and strategic ministry to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish world. Uh, Up to this point, uh, the followers of Jesus have sometimes bumped into non-Jewish people And there's been maybe some evangelism or some ministry, but it's been kind of random. But from this point on, what we see is a determined and dedicated effort to take this message beyond their walls. These two, Barnabas and Saul, they're going to travel all the way across what is now Turkey, which is a really long car ride. I've done that. Uh, But they're going to do it on foot into Greece, back again, back and forth multiple times. They're going to experience miracles. They're going to nearly die several times. And along the way, Saul's going to write a couple of New Testament books, okay? So this is a really big thing that begins here. And the gospel would go to the non-Jewish world in a big way 
And the response is going to be absolutely amazing. And it is not stretching the truth to say that you and I are sitting in church today because of what started then in Antioch. The willingness of that church to send some people beyond their borders to the non-Jewish world. It's huge. So we see this Antioch church directed by the Spirit. They sent Barnabas and they sent Saul as messengers. And we see God using this church to confirm and to affirm the call of God on some of their people. Uh, I talked to Kim Baker this week. So a lot of you know Kim, right? She's a missionary. She's sent from our church. She's in Africa. She serves with Missionary Aviation Fellowship. And uh, I got to have a Skype conversation with her. Skype is awesome. I'm pretty sure it was invented just for missionaries because it's so cool. And one of the things in our conversation that she related to me and actually emphasized was uh, how awesome it is to her to know and to feel sent by this church. And the way that that encourages her and has helped her persevere even when things are difficult and hard for her there. And so as this church has confirmed the fact that God has set her aside for something amazing and we've participated in that, so she's been the recipient of that. And so she just wanted me to say again to you, thank you for that. All right, so this is big stuff. This church, directed by the Spirit, sends out some messengers beyond their walls. And obviously, that's a really good example for us, that we should be like that. We should be guided by the Spirit to set people apart, to send them as messengers. But I want you to see that there's something bigger happening here. There's something happening here that's more than just an example of something we should do. There's something happening in this passage that is going to speak to the kind of people we should be. Because the truth is, going forward, this church rises to prominence, and I think it's largely because they embraced this idea of sending messengers into the world. And they become a driving force in the push, in the spread of the gospel to the outer ends of the earth. And the question that we have to ask is why? How did they get to that place? What sustained them over time in this kind of ministry? And it's the answer to that question that will reveal to us something about uh, who we ought to be. And to see it, we have to back up. We've got to zoom out a little bit and see a little broader perspective. In fact, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning of time uh, to see something about our God. Our God is ascending God. And if we go all the way back in time to the beginning, when God decided that he wanted to reconcile people to himself, that he wanted to redeem them, make it possible for their sin to be forgiven and for them to be reconnected with God, he embarked on a long series of sending. He sent. You remember how God sent Moses to the people to draw them and say, you can be my people and I can be your God? And then over the history of the people in the Old Testament, he sent them judges who would direct them and kings who would show them things about God and prophets who would reveal his word to them about what it meant to be God's people and how he longed for them to be in relationship with them. Our God is ascending God, but all of this sending he does is really uh, just sort of a precursor to the main act of sending that he does, which is sending us Jesus. Because our God is ascending God, And he sends us Jesus. In the Gospel of John, the theme of sending is very strong. And I want to show you a few uh, verses from John chapter 17, which is a prayer that Jesus prays that shows us his understanding of how he was sent by God. So John 17, it's a prayer that Jesus prays. He's praying to God, but he's doing it in front of his disciples. So he's talking to God, but he wants them to hear. It's the kind of prayer that his pastors were really good at, you know. Oh, Lord, as we go out today, would you just remind us to buy our tickets for the Travis Cottrell concert? It's on October 14th at 6 o'clock. Lord, would you, you know, that's, right? We're talking to God, but we're really talking to you, right? That's what we do. And so that's what Jesus is doing in John chapter 17. And if you saw verse 3, 
you'd hear Jesus, this is him saying, he's praying, right? He's saying, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Do you see him understanding that he has been sent by God? If you jump down to verse 8, you'd hear him say this, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. So our God is a sending God and God sends Jesus to us so that we can be redeemed. And then it doesn't take very long for Jesus to turn around and send his followers. Uh, If you jump down to verse 18, you'd hear Jesus say, As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. These are spoken before Jesus is crucified and risen from the dead. After he comes back from the grave, he says these same things to his followers. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So our God is a sending God, and our God sends Jesus, and then Jesus turns around and sends his followers to the world with this message of life. And we see this reflected in some of the stuff we've already talked about in the book of Acts, predominantly in verse 8, where Jesus says to them, you will be my witnesses, that's Jesus sending them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus has been sent by God, he turns around and sends his followers. Now I want to show you something about how the church in Antioch started. We're going to jump over to Acts 11, just a little bit before the things that we're studying in Acts chapter 13. And I want you to listen to how this church gets started. This is Acts 11, verse 19. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Now, look at verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Do you see that a group of people went to Antioch? That's because it was a group of people who understood that God had sent Jesus, and now Jesus sends their followers, his followers. They were followers, and so they were sent to Antioch. They went to Antioch and started the church there with a clear understanding that they were a people who'd been sent. When I moved to Corona in 1992, I had a really clear understanding of what it meant to be sent. Because literally, our church sent us there to start something new. And it affected everything about the way I lived in that community. The way I met my neighbors and built relationships with them, it was fueled by this understanding that I'd been sent with the message of Jesus to this place. When we would meet people in the grocery stores or through the schools, everything was motivated by understanding, knowing that I'd been sent with the message of Jesus. And that's what these people in Antioch understood. They were sent. And so when it comes time for those people who had been sent to Antioch to now turn around and send some of theirs beyond the walls of Antioch, it's business as usual for them. They embraced their role as senders. They sent Barnabas and Saul because they understood that they, all of them, were a sent people. And it makes a profound impact on the way we view our church, the way we view ourselves when we embrace our role as a sent people. Here's how we often view ourselves as a church especially when it comes to things like missions. We're big fans of missions. We love it, and we support it, and we invest in it financially and emotionally. And it kind of reminds me of a sporting event, right? It kind of reminds us of being this crowd of people who are invested heavily into the action that's going on in the field. And we love it, we invest in it, we support it. You know, we're these raving fans. 
But sometimes we view our role as spectators in the stands. Let me give you another picture, and I think it's the picture that the church at Antioch would have had of their role in all of this. And it comes from another sporting event, not a football game, but a sporting event called the Tough Mudder. Have any of you heard of the Tough Mudder? Yeah, the Tough Mudder, it's part marathon, part obstacle court, part torture test, okay? And it happens in locations all over the country. Last June, they had one in Colorado up at a ski resort, and some guys from my church there participated. And so when you enter the Tough Mudder, you, you do all kinds of amazingly difficult things over the course of 10 miles. Things like sloshing through mud and water uh, where they have, you see those yellow things, where they have little electrodes uh, ready to zap you every time you touch them. You, no, it's true. You swim across vats of ice water, right? You carry trees around. I mean, it's, it's amazing and it's very difficult, but you do it as a team. You do it together. And so things happen like this. Do you see this picture? This is a team. This is part of a team. And do you see what they're doing? He, he's helping that guy get over the wall. And that's how the Antioch church viewed themselves. Not as spectators cheering and investing from, from the sidelines, but as participants, members of the team, just helping some of their guys get over the wall and get a little farther. That's what it means when we embrace our role as a sent people. Not just senders, we've been sent. And that's what sustained their passion and their vision for this gospel ministry around the world. And I think it's the reason that this church becomes predominant while the church in Jerusalem fades from view and we never hear from them again. All right, what does this mean about us? What does this have to do with us? Here's what it means to us. We're going to embrace our role as a people who are sent, as well as senders. We're going to continue to send messengers. We're going to continue to let the Spirit of God direct us to those that He has set apart to go as messengers to places all over the globe. It means we're going to continue to do, just like they talked about in Acts chapter 13, we're going to lay hands on and we're going to send off those who have been called so that they can go. We're going to continue to have short-term opportunities where people can take part in this ministry, like our team that's going to Ecuador in November. We're going to continue to make it possible for people to have long-term experiences as they are called out by God and we send them. But here's what we will not do. We will not rest on our laurels. We will not sit back and pat ourselves on the back and say, what a nice missions program we've had in the past. Because it's continuing. And we will continue to ask ourselves, Lord, who are you setting apart? Lord, where are you sending us? Where are we going? Because we are going to continue to send messengers. It also means we will embrace our role as a sent people. We're going to remember that all of Jesus' followers are called to be messengers. And as a church, we have to redefine ourselves as the people of God who are sent by God into the world with the life-giving message of the gospel. Forty-nine and a half years ago, when the Yorba Linda Friends Church in faith sent a small group of people to start a new work here at the corner of Rose Drive and Baston Cherry, I'll bet it was pretty clear that they were sent. I'll bet those people had that clear understanding that they were a people sent with the message of Jesus. And those kinds of days are good and exciting because all you do is focus on getting the message out, pointing people to the cross, bringing them to the knowledge of the Savior. But something can happen. I wasn't there 49 and a half years ago, so I don't really know, but here's what can happen. When we focus all of our, attendance, or all of our attention on reaching people and finding people, we get good at it. And people start coming and suddenly we have to do other things, right? 
I mean, somebody has to watch these kids that are showing up. And so we have to have programs and we, we have to have ministries and we have to have buildings and all of these good things to help disciple and develop the people we reached. That's good. But you know what can happen over time? The scales can tip just a little so that all of our energy or most of our energy can be absorbed providing ministries and programs and buildings for the people that we've reached. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to summon all of our will and tip the scales towards reaching people because we're a people who've been sent. You've been sent into your neighborhood. You've been sent into the place that you work. You've been sent to that person that somehow you see them every time you're at the grocery store. You've been sent. And we want to embrace that role because that's who we are. And that's what God wants to do. So in the same way that the Antioch church was directed by the Spirit of God to send out messengers, and in the same way that the church in Antioch embraced their role, they sent because they were sent. We're going to step into that in a new and focused way. As we close this morning, Greg and Molly are going to come back up on the stage, and Greg's going to lead us, and we're going to pray. And like we so often do and should do, we're going to lay hands on Molly, and we're going to pray for her because she's been set apart, and we're going to stand with her, beside her, as that occurs. But before Greg prays, you know what else we're going to do? We're going to embrace the fact that we've all been sent. And so I'm going to ask you to do something that might make you feel a little uncomfortable. I want you to scoot up next to somebody and let's all lay our hands on one another. Because Molly has been sent, but you know what? You've all been sent. And as we pray this morning, we're going to symbolize that by getting close enough just to someone so that we can lay our hands on them. And let that be a reminder to us that we're all sent people.